I want to welcome you to PolySci 100 uh, for the summer session. I am so happy you're here, and uh, I'm excited about getting you uh, sort of engaged and uh, clued into this uh, this first uh, week and this first chapter lecture. Ordinarily, if we were in class, I don't usually just lecture at my students. I usually are involved in a bigger discussion where I may start off the discussion and talk about things, but then I quickly jump into the most important part, which is what do you think? And that's like the most important question that I ask. And even in the discussions and the things you have to do uh, for this class over the next six weeks, the, really the, what I'm looking for from you is the answer, what do you think? So when you read something, when I ask you a question in the discussions and when you respond to your classmates, I'm asking you to tell me what you think about what I say, what they say, how you feel about it. Do you agree or disagree with it? Those are the things that we're getting to. Um, and when I'm doing these lectures, uh, the weekly lectures, you'll probably see different variations. Like today, I'm going to be like here, and then I'm going to drop into the little corner on your right uh, in just a moment here, and I'll have the PowerPoints up uh, for this particular section. But then other times, I might just be me. You just see me. Uh, sorry, I don't have any makeup on, so you have to deal with me the way I am. Uh, and then other times it might be where I just have the PowerPoint up without me. So I'm going to play around a little bit. Depends on how I'm feeling from, day, from week to week, but um, you're still going to get the same information uh, no matter how you're looking at it. Okay. So without further ado, I'm going to jump into the first uh, of our uh, lectures and put the PowerPoints. So again, the first chapter really just is just an introduction to political science. And I'm assuming that some of you probably had it in high school uh, or may have had some basis of it. Um, my classes are usually a little different than that. I mean, while I set up the basis, I really like to get into all kinds of controversial issues and try to unwind some of the hypocrisy of things that we learn throughout our, our formative years of education uh, regarding political science and politics. Because I will tell you from the very beginning as we start this, politics involves every aspect of your life. Nothing you do does not have a political reference to it. And a lot of times people think of it as oh, it's just government. Well, no, that's not necessarily true. It's bigger than that. It's much, much more than that. As a matter of fact, I will tell you, well, let's start off with something very basic. So when you, if I were to ask you, what does politics mean to you? When you hear the word politics, what comes off to you? Um, and in fact, this first chapter, this, the, the video, I mean, the PowerPoint here says power and politics. So, um, I will tell you the answer to the question is that the core understanding of anything that we talk about, the political science or politics, starts with the basis of power. Now, you might ask, so what is power? Well, for the lack of sake and brevity, I will tell you that power is the ability to influence. In fact, you could go further and say that power is the ability to influence your behavior about and how you see the world around you and how you see yourself. And you might say, well, how do they do that? What do you mean? What do you mean by that? Well, think about it. If I can influence you to tell you that iPhone is the best phone, right? Will you go buy an iPhone? Sure. But what if it wasn't? What if it was a, the Q phone instead of the iPhone that was the best? And I was able to persuade you, manipulate you into thinking that the Q phone was better than the iPhone. Would you go buy a Q phone? Probably. Well, how did you, who influenced your belief about that? You know, how do you know that, that, that it's the best phone? You know, and, you know, and did, did you do your homework? And most of the time we don't do our homework. We just basically let people tell us what we want to think and then we follow behaviors. And that's part of our human nature. But the key aspect to the entire aspect, any aspect of political science that you cover, whether it's in this class or one of the other classes like American politics or comparative or international relations or political philosophy, the key concept is power. And again, never ever forget, and you wanna write that down, power is the ability to influence. Now, saying that, there are four key types of power that we look at um, in, that are under the umbrella of power. The first type is called force. And force is the physical use of power. So if I, you know, militarily speaking, if, if, if I bring my tank up to, to you and I point it at you with this big giant cannon and I say, turn right, what are you going to do? Well, if you're smart, you're going to turn right, right? Hopefully you'd have a sense of direction. You won't go left. Don't go left. Bad things happen. 
turn right, right? Because why? Because I have now brought my big gun and pointed it at you and said, turn right. Um, and so that's kind of the essence of physical use of power. Now, there's another side of power that's, that's also under the umbrella of force, and that's non-physical. It's psychological, right? And so, for example, the, the def, under the umbrella of psychological force, which is non-physical, is terror, terrorism. So, you know, we, could, for, we can go back and look at the horrific event of 9-11-2001, where we lose the World Trade Center is, you know, attacked and they take down two buildings and thousands of lives are lost. But here's another important aspect of that. Those folks who committed that act don't ever have to commit another physical act of violence. All they have to do is make a phone call and threaten to do so, and people will have to respond to the threat, right? So that's a psychological control of you. So I'm still controlling you by making you think that I might do it, right? So different than the actual physical force, you know, whether you whether I'm bringing an army to you, which is a physical use, right? Or whether I'm just trying to make you believe I will bring an army to you if you don't do what I tell you to do. That's psychological. And both are equally as powerful in many ways. Um, the psychological damage of what of making people believe something about that you will act a certain way is pretty powerful. The second type is called persuasion. And persuasion is when I try to persuade you by giving you all the information to be to to turn right instead of turn left. So I say there, here's all the good things about turning right, and this is why you should do this. And but I also provide for you, yeah, there are some good things on the left here too, but but the but you know, if you're looking at both, you can see that there's more on the right. But I'm giving you all the information, the pros and cons of both sides. The third type is called manipulation. And manipulation works this way. All the good stuff is here on the right. The, the left, bad, bad. <laughs> the right, good, good, right? And I don't tell you much about the bad on the, about and nothing good on the left. I only tell you the bad on the left because why? I want you to go to the right. Make sense? So I want you to go right so I make the right look really good and make the left look really bad. But I'm concealing part of the good on the left so you don't think anything's good on the left. Trusting that you're probably not gonna go investigate, you're just gonna let me tell you what I want you to believe and then you're gonna follow what I tell you to do. Okay, makes sense? Yeah, so that's manipulative, right? And that's typically what we see that happens today in America most of the time is the fact that the pub general public is manipulated quite a bit by misinformation that comes from the government and other folks that drive the that drive our daily lives. Uh, and that's unfortunate because we make all kinds of decisions. And if you don't have the truth, how do you make a good decision? It's hard to get to a good decision if you're not willing to challenge what, what you've been told or at least investigate if what they told you was true. Even our founding fathers said, you know what? Uh, be, you know, believe in your country, but don't trust the leaders. <laughs> you know, investigate the people because the leaders because they're human beings and they're usually power motivated, you know, and, and uh, you have to be able to make sure you hold them accountable. And that's something we rarely do in our system today. Even today, as we confront, you know, the criminality of things that happen in our own country that normally you think happen in other countries, then we find it happens here in our own system. And there are lots of reasons for it. Most of it's driven by money, but we'll talk more about that a little bit later in the class. Uh, so understanding that is really important. So the last form, the fourth form, is called uh, exchange. And exchange is kind of like a barter, a trade. So uh, I give you something, you give me something in return, so we don't go to war or fight each other. Uh, so a good example of that would be like uh, the Cuban Missile Crisis in 1962. We almost come to the brink of blowing up the world, United States versus Soviet Union. And what ended up saving us was that we made a deal with the Soviets quietly and under behind the scenes We'll take our Jupiter II missiles out of Turkey that are pointed at you if you take the missiles out of Cuba. But don't tell anybody that we agreed to this, that we're because we don't want to look weak, meaning us, the United States. So they made an agreement, we made an agreement, and we avoided a war, a nuclear war, as a result of it. So those are the things that we have to be aware of. So, so recognizing, again, that power is the ability to influence, and then the four types of power, force, 
persuasion, manipulation, and exchange. Those are the things that you definitely want to keep in you in your brain throughout this entire six weeks because you, they will explain most of what you will have to learn throughout this process. Okay, so let's jump into the PowerPoints a little bit just to kind of get what your appetite. Um, so again, politics is the begin starts off with the basically that in, every society has to have uh, institutional framework or institutions of government to not to operate. Whether you're a democracy or non democracy, you have to have an infrastructure that drives your your society. You know the things that mechanisms of government that allow for you to, to uh, distribute goods and services to the people, build an economy, uh, use your resources, those types of things to get it to have the day to day operation of your country even work requires politics. So this is the thing that why I say it's so important you understand that it's part of every aspect of your life, because all those different things that, it, that requires and that are required of society are the th and the institutions of government are the things that involve are derived from power. Now, let me move on here. So when we talk about you know the idea of, of political and the process of po politics and how it works. Uh, Harold Laswell, you know, was very famously made this comment about that basically politics is uh, how deciding who gets what, when, where, and how. Or not where, but uh, who gets what, who who gets what, when, and how. Ooh, let me try that again. Uh, and so with that, it's important to recognize that, you know, what does he mean by that? So what he means is that, well, okay, so we're talking about, and politically speaking, who gets what, meaning, you know, what what do people, what do the people get? And then, of course, what the leadership gets, when do they get it, and the processes by which they get it. How? The how is the process. And so he's the first person to kind of very succinctly uh, lay out this sort of ideology about uh, the basis of politics and power and how it works. So under the umbrella or auspices of politics, there are three primary assumptions that we that exist within societies and people. Uh, it basically says in, within our human nature that we all have our own wants, needs, and desires. You know, one of the things I'm always keen about saying to my students that, you know, it's not just about you. So when you're thinking about, you know, when you vote for certain things or you want things a certain way, it's okay to want what you want as a human being individually, but it's also equally important to recognize that it's not just about you and that just because, you know, you have to think about the greater good of society. And in that, by thinking about the greater good means that you will still benefit from it. But if you think it's just about you, chances are you're going to be mad all the time because they don't make laws and policies to serve just your interest. <laughs> they do it to serve everyone's interest. It's okay to have those thoughts, but it's okay to also recognize that it's bigger than you and to recognize that. Um, it's also number two, as you can see, says the resources that satisfy human needs uh, are usually scarce. That everyone can be wealthy or powerful uh, or, pres or as prestigious as they like to be. Everybody wants to be a movie star or everybody wants to be a, an astronaut or everybody wants to be a musician or a rock star, right? Well, true, first of all, everybody doesn't want that. But there's certainly you can make an argument that says that, that within our human necessities of what we want, um, that they are limited, that everyone can't be successful, that there are a certain number of people who are wealthy on the planet. You know, it's used about five or ten percent of the planet who has most of the money, and so therefore the idea of what we really want and need uh, may not be as readily available as we like to think that it is. Uh, and so there's also by recognizing that it re requires us to take another action or maybe relook at how we do things, right? Um, and then third, most of the things we want, uh, which we call benefits, are extremely costly. And there's also, uh, they're paid with money and with our economic resources. So, uh, and sometimes, you know, with money, in fact, you could argue that in fact, wars are usually fought over around issues regarding economics more than anything, or a commodity that leads to economic gain. And a lot of human lives have been lost as a result of this. So the impact can be, can cost someone or groups of people their lives as a result of this as well. So for example, if you control the water source that a kingdom or a country down the road really needed that have, had more power than you, what would they do to control your water resource? Or maybe they come in and they, they you know, destroy your, destroy your city 
or your country in order to get access to the water resource. Or if they, you had gold and they didn't have any gold, but they had you know, a, a bigger army, then they come and take all your gold, right? And so those kinds of things is what it's alluding to. The thing, again, these are things that are relevant to our human nature, I say that dictate about how we go about living our lives politically. Uh, and then we go into the idea, of course, of the, how we, the, the distribution, uh, how it plays out in politics. So as you can talk about uh, the processes that exist within societies that, and that in fact, societies cannot function without the, a distributed process that basically gets goods and services out to the, to the people. So it doesn't mean everybody's going to get the exact same thing, but to try to provide the necessities of society, the, the necessities of society to all people. Uh, that's the thing that's most important. Oh, there's one other thing. I think I missed it there. So let me drop back one. Um, the other thing had to do with the idea when we talk about uh, the ideas of politics, if we tend to look at them as being positive, uh, and they certainly can be if used, utilized proper, properly, but there are also aspects within our human nature that people could argue, would argue that, that it basically can lead to corruption and, and, and degradation and people end up being abused and manipulated by, by leaders and by people who, and corporations who have money. Uh, and we see this play out time and time again in our own world. Um, so is, is, it, is it inherently corrupt? Well, it certainly can be, um, particularly with all the money that's thrown at it today. You know, not just in America either. We're certainly looking inside of our own house, but where you can say the, the impact of money in America certainly has dictated a lot of the reality of how our lives are in our country. And those who have the most tend to want to help those who don't have the most, not very much. So. Uh, we struggle. We we have great words about how much we care about each other, but in practice, uh, sometimes we struggle a little bit. Uh, the haves don't want to necessarily have, help the have-nots. Uh, of course, the, you can look at corruption. They give you some examples with Hitler and Stalin and Castro and Saddam Hussein and these dictators and so forth. But again, there's also within our own country, uh, we certainly have a lot of corruption within our political system. And uh, so it means that I think in order to have a successful democracy, you have to have the courage to call it out. You have to have the courage to deal with it and uh, and not lower the bar to where you actually potentially destroy your democratic process or have the people involved in that process. So as I said, remember, politics is definitely a process and it's basically carried out based on the, our, our ideas of ourself, our human nature. Our human nature dictates uh, how the processes of politics are carried out from one country to the next. The historical realities of, of, of one's uh, country, uh, the historical reality of, and of their regional impact, the impact of religion, the impact of all the various cultural aspects of their society, the economic impacts, all drive and impact our human nature. And they say something about who we are. And that also in those societies dictate the relative success or failure within those countries. Uh, and so it's, it, it, you know, certainly within that con the biggest struggle that we face, particularly in dem democratic systems, is the aspect of, of corruption and how corruption plays into the system and how much it can potentially damage or destroy democratic practices or systems. So when you talk about the extremist aspect of this, the extremist aspect of what we call anarchists, and anarchists basically don't believe in any processes, really. Uh, they basically believe that it's basically best if you have a free-for-all. Uh, so they really like it to basically have uh, nothing, be no structure, uh, and basically let things kind of fall in the way they do. And you see here, as it says, anarchists see the political process as, at best, an unnecessary appendage to society. So they're saying they'd rather have no structure at all. In fact, they blame that the, the structure on being the cause of failure within societies. Well, there are people who believe that, but you know, I think there's, you know, if you look at the evidence, there's, uh, there are people can see also that there's a danger to having what we would call ultimate freedom, uh, which people sometimes try to use anarchy as being ult the ultimate freedom. But I think the ultimate freedom really is, isn't real because 
freedom dictates your freedom can impinge on my freedom and therefore how free are we really in this reality especially under the idea of anarchy okay i'm going to skip a little bit here so again the two basic aspects of politics are government and power uh those are the two uh, off the, the umbrellas under which politics exist and again governments are the institutional framework power is how they can governments exist and control the people uh, power is the ability to influence and that's what governments utilize to, in order to control the masses uh, machiavelli one of our great political theorists uh, wrote and again let me remind you as i'm covering a couple of these these uh of these philosophers political philosophers Remember, they only have the ability to, to take a snapshot of time in the world they exist. So recognize that so that when you see their view of the world, it's only derived from the time they live in and the world, the way the world is that they exist in, and also looking backward. They don't have the luxury of looking forward, but what they look at, what's most important is human nature in, in, during, during their time. So Machiavelli basically wrote this famous book called The Prince. And basically, he says that it's better for a leader to be feared than loved, uh, that man was basically the root of all evil and that they needed to be controlled. And basically, because man was self-centered and self-serving, uh, that they really uh, are only driven to their own self, to their own self-interest and never looking at society and the basis of society for the, for the success of all people. Uh, so again, he figured by uh, by controlling the masses, being the strong leader, uh, uh, that that was most important. That you should separate your moral your moral ideas or the sense of morality from your political actions. That they shouldn't you shouldn't make moral decisions uh, with political interest. So that way, if you had to go kill people as a result of uh, to to maintain power, that you don't have even if even if morally you think it's wrong you would still kill them because it makes sense. You deal with the, the moral considerations are set aside because it's more important to stay in power and control the, control the government. Uh, two other famous theorists real quickly here, Thomas Hobbes and John Locke, uh, who are also writing in the 6th, 17th, 18th century. Thomas Hobbes writes a famous book called The Leviathan. Uh, it's a book that takes a very negative view of nature, of human nature. He's writing this during the a really ugly time in, in, in uh, European history. And again, he goes back and, you know, human, basically human beings are pretty rotten, need to be controlled, and need a high state of order uh, in order to control the, people, the human beings because they are rotten and competitive and, and so greed and self-motivated. So kind of another variation of, of the... Uh, Machiavelli notion. Uh, again, Hobbes says that man's incapable of ruling himself and uh, of controlling and ruling himself. So that's why you need these authoritarian systems to be able to provide and control and provide security. And then John Locke, uh, who's, who uh, writes this very famous uh, this uh, book called The Two Treatises of Government. And uh, he believed that human beings basically were pretty decent. and uh, and basically just governed by reason. And uh, if you got them to govern by reason that they would make better decisions. He believed in the concept of natural law and that basically the sense of that uh, every individual was entitled to life, liberty, and property. That that was just a God-given natural right for all human beings. So he's, a, you know, he's taken a much more positive view of human beings than, than Hobbes did or Machiavelli. But again, you're talking about snapshots in time in the world in which they existed. Uh, he, you know, Locke also believed that individuals should be re able to pursue their own self-interest, which really had to do with the acquisition of property at that time. Uh, uh, and that's the way you kind of focused in and where your interest would lie in terms of your own success. Uh, that governments were in place to provide justice. Uh, and that a moral government uh, must be designed to protect the natural state of men and in, in, uh, in the state of nature, so that everything was built around the idea of maintaining uh, a morale, uh, having a moral government that was basically, if you had moral men making decisions, that they would basically be focused on, again, protecting the, the rights of men.
to life, liberty, and property, and which is again this called the state of nature. And again, Locke thought this could be done, of course, through establishing laws, uh, high, you know, basically bringing in judges to administer justice, and then having an executive with the power to enforce the law, hence a president. Uh, so again, this talks about the notion of human nature, you know, so they ask the question, is, human, is man f first a social or a communal animal and who naturally seeks to work with, work, work with and cooperate with others? For the betterment of all society, or is he self-interested, as as, as Hobbes and Machiavelli uh, illustrate, and brought together by force and forced to cooperate, you know, uh, for basically for the good for the betterment of all of his own interests. Uh, and then the last one is: Are people born what they call uh, tabula rosa, which basically means you're born with a blank a blank slate? And uh, to be written on, meaning that you come blank and then you're, then you're socialized through your processes. And I would argue that's an interesting point because I think most of us are probably fairly blank when we get here and we, know, we learn through our families for sometimes for the better, sometimes for the worse, uh, about how we see the world around us. And those things are built and fortified throughout our, our lives and constantly evolving. Again, this is, gives you an example of some of the bad guys out there. Uh, the question is, you know, posed, can people learn to cooperate if given the proper encouragement? And the consequence of that gives you some people here, as you can see, and down here, you've got Karl Marx. Marx gets blamed for a lot of things, but Karl, Karl Marx was a guy who basically just had a, had a, you know, was an, basically had a theory about how human beings would react when, when controlled by money. He had an economic theory that he gets blamed for a lot of stuff. Uh, and then you come up here to Lenin, and then from Lenin you get to Stalin, and then Mao Zedong and Hitler and Mussolini. Well, these guys are all, you know, what we would call bad guys, but nonetheless, they are the people who we look to and ask those questions, which are very complicated answers to. Um, okay, I think uh, I am done for chapter one. Um, that went a few minutes longer than I wanted. I'm going to try and keep these about 20 minutes, maybe 25 max, but uh, you can always stop pause and come back. And I will see you in chapter two. So thanks a lot, you guys. Have a good afternoon.